So nothing life in life, of course, is guaranteed. There um, has never been an assurance or a guarantee that our species will continue indefinitely into the future. Uh, but the evolutionary pattern illustrates the power of human ingenuity to solve problems and create new ones in their stead. Our next speaker takes the view from space, continuing on that theme. She is a professor of ecology and sustainable development at Columbia University in New York. Please welcome Ruth DeFries. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to talk about a different kind of evolution, and that's the evolution of how we as humans, our species, uses nature to produce the, the things that are fundamentally important to us. And what is more fundamentally important to us than food? So I'd like to talk about the history of how we have produced so much food and what it tells us about us and our evolution and our ability for survival into the future. So this to me is an incredible image of night lights from space and it shows how far we have come in this evolution. What we're seeing here is in the wealthy parts of the world Humanity is concentrated in those tiny spots of light in the cities. In the less wealthy parts of the world, people are increasingly moving into those tiny spots of light. And in a few decades from now, most all of humanity will be living in cities. That's an incredible way that humans have evolved to manipulate nature to the extent that enough food can be provided in those spaces between those spots of life to feed all those people who are congregated in cities. How did we get there? So 200,000 years ago, we were pretty much like other species. We were hunting and gathering and foraging for our food and the energy that we got from our food was, um, was more than the energy that we put into collecting it. And now we are a species in the wealthy parts of the world that lives off of food produced largely by mechanization, by fertilizer, by irrigation. We have manipulated nature to an extraordinary extent. An enormous evolution in the way that we use nature to produce what we need. The most pivotal step in that evolution is the domestication of crops starting about 12,000 years ago of wheat and a corn and wheat and rice and tomatoes. That changed humanity, an enormous, um, enormous change in our evolution in the way we use nature, and for good and for bad. On one hand, the domestication of agriculture allowed people to live in cities. It allowed enormous growth in population. It allowed surplus food, surplus grain. It allowed civilization, stratification of societies, people were able to specialize in, in particular tasks as opposed to everyone uh, engaged in food production, enormous step. But it also came with its set of problems. Tuberculosis and measles, for example, were two, two diseases that emerged from, uh, for crowding and living close to livestock. Diets became starchier and less diverse. People became shorter. There was more tooth decay, people were less healthy, life expectancy dropped. Uh, so it created a lot of benefits for, for humanity and a lot of problems. One of the biggest problems that domestication of agriculture created was that how do we keep the soils fertile? With agriculture, the nutrients that are in the soil go into the crop that gets taken out and eaten somewhere else, and the natural recycling of nutrients is broken unless there is a way to replenish the soil. So a lot of the evolution in the way that we use nature is around that problem that was created starting 12,000 years ago of how do we keep the nutrients going back into the soil? If the nutrients are depleted from the soil, not able to grow food, and that's basically the end of um, civilization. So 
this has to do with, you probably really don't want to see the periodic table up here. <laughs> but I just want to make the point that one of those elements on the periodic table is essential to this story of how um, humanity has used nature to produce more and more food, and that is nitrogen. Because nitrogen is abundant in the atmosphere, but it's in short supply for plants. It's the most lim it's the essentially the limiting nutrient for plant growth. So unless there is a way to get that, that nitrogen into the soil, out of the atmosphere, into the soil, and to keep recycling in the soil, then, then fertility will be depleted. So as the crops take the nitrogen out, we need a way to get it back in. So how did humanity solve this problem? For hundreds of years, ancient China solved this problem by mimicking the natural recycling process. So ancient China was um, highly urbanized, and they solved the problem of soil fertility by collecting human waste and animal waste and all kinds of waste in, from the cities and the towns and carrying it in buckets back to the fields and using it to replenish the soil. This was the process. It worked. It was the process that, that fed ancient China. It was used in Europe up, in, up through the Industrial Revolution as a way to overcome this problem that was created with the domestication of agriculture. As um, the Industrial Revolution went forward and people congregated more and more in cities, it became less, less and less practical, and we need other ways to get that nitrogen, those nutrients back into the soil. So for quite a few decades in the, uh, in the 19th century, civilization, or at least Europe, lived off of bird excrement coming from the, uh, the western coast of South America, where there are large stores of basically bird, um, bird poop. So this, at that time, Bird excrement was the oil of the time. It created fortunes. There were fortunes made on mining this excrement that was collected on rocks off of the coast of South America, shipping, the, shipping it across the Atlantic Ocean, and farmers then spreading it on their fields. Enormous fortunes. Of course, that has its end because there's just so much bird excrement and the birds aren't replenishing it fast enough to make up for how much is being mined. In the early 20th century, there's probably the most underappreciated but most civilization-changing uh, discovery by Fritz Haber, the German scientist, who has a very interesting and uh, mixed uh, past. He's also accused of being a war criminal. But he also made the discovery that changed the world. He figured out how to uh, take the nitrogen in the air and suck it down with industrial processes, apply a lot of energy, and transform that nitrogen into the form that plants can use, and then package it into bags of fertilizer and, um, and be able to keep uh, crops growing and keep soils fertile. So this is civilization changing, because no longer is civilization tethered to bird excrement or to carrying buckets of human waste back from the city. But as long as there's enough energy and there are factories to pull the nitrogen out of the air through this, through this process, the problem of soil fertility is, um, is, uh, is solved. So that was the basis, a key part of the most remarkable, what I think is the most remarkable achievement of the last century. And that is to produce incredible amounts of food. We all know that population increased exponentially during the last century, but food production increased even faster. So there is more, at the end of the century, there was more food calories produced per person than there was in the middle of the century, even accounting for all of that population growth. That is an enormous, incredible achievement that speaks to the ingenuity and the evolution in the way that humanity has figured out how to manipulate nature for its own uh, betterment. Of course, just like the domestication of agriculture some 12,000 years ago, that brings its own set of problems, and we know there are many. 
the many environmental problems associated with industrial agriculture, the problem around the world of the epidemic of um, overweight and obesity and all the diseases that go along with that. So thankfully today, the number of undernourished people is still too high in this world of plenty, but is declining. Less than a billion people, about 800 million people at this point. The number of overweight and obese people is increasing. Two billion and increasing around the world. And this is not just a developed country problem, around the developing world, where obesity is quite an epidemic. So we not only, we solve problems, and we create problems, which I think is the pattern in our evolution, in the way we use nature, and the pattern in our, uh, in our history. So when we look at this long story of how we've figured out more and better ways to manipulate nature and produce more and more food with genetics and fertilizer and irrigation and all of these very clever things we've done, we see an evolution that is that, it, that goes in fits and starts, sort of a, a punctuated <laughs> evolution, where we figure out a way to, to manipulate nature that then provides for us, and that inevitably leads to some kind of problem, uh, shortages or some kind of problem, and then we go to another solution. And that seems to be the way we are. That seems to be the way we are as a species. That's, um, one way of thinking about that is we'll always be solving problems. But an, another way to think about that is we can always come up with solutions too. Now we can't always, we can't assume that we can solve every problem that we have created in, in the future. But if we look at our past, we see that we have overcome lots and lots of problems with our, uh, with our ingenuity. And that seems to be our way we are as a species, that we're always living in an experiment, we're always creating new problems, we're always solving those problems which create new problems, and that is probably the way we will always exist as a species. That there are really no silver bullets. We are living in an incredibly transformative time, and I think it's, it may be as transformative as the domestication of agriculture some 12,000 years ago, in that we're now transitioning from being a farming species to an urban species. And that is a fundamentally different way of being. It's a different way of feeding civilization. Most people, as farmers, were engaged in producing, uh, producing food. Going forward, most people will not be engaged in producing food, and it is a, a, a fundamentally different way that we are uh, using nature to keep civilization grow going. So you can see that most of the population growth from, from here on out is in less developed regions and is in urban regions. So we are now an urban species, which will create problems for us and will also lead us to new solutions. So that's where we are as a species. We're always living in an experiment. There are never silver bullets. We will always be creating new problems and working towards new solutions. To me, that gives me a somewhat optimistic way of thinking about the world, is that we're, we're always in this, this pattern. Um, also, uh, a, little, a little disarming that we will never we'll never be able to say we're done with the problem of how do we get food from the world, how do we use nature. But we will always be experimenting, and I think that's just the, the, uh, the way we are. That's, that's who we are as a species. So thank you. So I guess, I guess as a species, we have job security, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. So um, what, what about uh, the, the, this idea of carrying capacity? Where, where, where does that graph end? Where, where, when do we run out of space and ingenuity? And, yeah. Or when does our fear of GMOs get, get us to the point where we can't keep sustaining it? Well, I think carrying capacity is a very nice concept from an ecological point of view. The concept that uh, a species will uh, expand until the area that they have available to them cannot support them anymore. It runs out of resources. But when we apply carrying capacity to humans, I think the concept um, 
becomes a lot more nuanced uh, and a little bit falls apart, the concept, because what we've seen through the long history of humanity is that we keep increasing the, the carrying capacity. Now, of course, that creates new problems, but in terms of being able to supply enough resources, we see that the carrying capacity is not a static, uh, you know, a static absolute amount. All right. If we, of course, if we have too many people and they're too obese, won't the planet kind of sink? Maybe. That, Maybe that, that's yeah, the that, way That could be a problem, right? We've got to watch that. All right. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Ruth.